as Athena said, uh, I will talk to you about um, Athens as a contemporary landscape. I'm a contemporary archaeologist at the University of Oxford, and I'm currently working on a project called um, Architectures of Displacement, which is coming to the end. Um, just a little bit of background, it's a joint project between the um, Refugee Studies Centre and the Pitt Rivers Museum. Um, I'm based at the Pitt Rivers Museum. And the idea is to bring together architects, anthropologists, uh, archaeologists to have a multidisciplinary perspective on modern contemporary um, refugee shelter. Um, so we are looking at five countries and I've done work predominantly in France and Greece and today I'm just going to focus on the Athens work. Um, just at the start, uh, I, a, a quick note to, to sort of let you know why I use the term refugee throughout the paper. Um, essentially because I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a border guard, and frankly I don't care. <laughs> I'm an archaeologist and I see my uh, reclamation of the word as a, a very small political act. The um, Oxford English Dictionary describes a refugee as someone escaping all sorts of things, not just war in Syria. Um, so to me, the, the use of the word refugee, um, particularly as an archaeologist, I've had to delve into lots of literature about humanitarianism written from um, whether it's uh, anthropology or um, uh, more, the, the humanitarian literature is huge and there's a lot of time, I think, wasted discussing whether or not a person is a forced migrant or a forcibly displaced person. Or So I'm just going to use the term refugee and you can disagree with me if you like. Um, so a very much reduced history of Athens for those who don't know. Uh, in 1974, the Polytechnion, there was a, a massive student uprising against the Junta. Um, since then, there's been a very strong culture of anarchism and squatting, particularly within an inner city area called Exarchia. Um, as Athena mentioned, um, there was a boy shot dead in 2008, um, Alexis Gogoropoulos. Yeah. Um, and this um, this re-inspired uh, a, a very sort of well-entrenched idea that, um, well, idea stroke <laughs> reality, <laughs> that the police in, in Athens are, are, a lot of whom do belong to the Golden Dawn, the far-right party. Um, there, there is a lot of trouble between uh, police and, and anarchists. And I think from my brief experience in Athens, um, it's also evident that um, the strong culture of anarchism does attract uh, anarchist tourists, if you like, from from, <laughs> from Britain, from all over the world, um, to, to kind of join the fight. Um, having said that, as an archaeologist, I was interested as well that there's a memorial within Exarchia to a boy who was shot in the back by police, 15, 15 or 16 year old boy, in 1985 as well. So there is a history of police violence um, within this area. Um, in 2008, uh, the so-called Greek debt crisis caused even bigger inequalities and um, produced essentially a small-scale humanitarian crisis within Greece. Thousands of Greece um, and also recent migrants from places like Albania and the first wave of Afghans um, were made unemployed and um, are hungry and homeless. By 2015, there were more than 700 um, refugees predominantly, but also generally poor people um, sleeping in very squalid conditions around the parks, around, um, around Athens, particularly in Victoria and uh, um, through the, um, uh, the big park, the big Olympic park. Um, oh, I can't remember the name of it. In Eleniko, yeah, but also in, in um, the big park, why is it, so if you walk down from Exarchia, there's a big park that, see, this is right, yeah, okay. So there's tons of people sleeping, and, and when I was there in 2017, um, it was very evident, incredibly worn paths, um, yeah, and lots and lots of detritus in terms of tents, evidence of latrines, people, people having to survive outside. Um, 2016, um, the EU-Turkey deal, which essentially the EU basically said to Turkey, okay, we'll give you some money, you keep the refugees, and we'll let some Turkish people um, come to the EU with, uh, with papers. 
This caused uh, the Macedonian border to very much harden and um, many of the refugees who were coming were actually significantly cash richer than, than the sort of neo-poor in Greece, which caused other tensions. And um, this uh, has, has kind of continued. There's about 60,000 refugees stuck in Greece currently, um, and there isn't enough food or jobs or housing. And so it doesn't do much to um, placate the, the sort of rise of the far right. Um, and even among very ordinarily liberal, educated people, there's a great sense that you know, everyone needs housing and food and, um, and there isn't enough to go around. So I, um, I, I, I was, I, I, my PhD was on homelessness in Bristol and York. And I came to refugee shelter really because in England at the end of my PhD, which I finished in 2014, I was starting within my homeless networks to meet um, uh, refugees. And, um, and so it was a natural progression in to it for me in terms of um, uh, being displaced, being another form of homelessness. So I, um, six months pregnant with a two-year-old in tow, <laughs> decided to go and spend some time in squats in Athens as you do. Um, so this is a sort of uh, uh, vague map, not, not terribly good, well, not terribly big map that I made of, of some of the sites that I visited. Um, as I said, I was six months pregnant, which actually I would recommend as an ethnographic tactic. It's, um, yeah. it's good. <laughs> you get to meet people. And particularly within uh, the refugee community, I found that I was able to speak with women and children in a way that other researchers weren't, because whether or not you speak you know, Pashto or Farsi or Greek, um, you can understand. Uh, and there's a, it's a leveler. Um, I, my, my methodology was very simple. I, I went to squats and spoke to people. They would tell me other places to go. Um, and my interest was really to try and document the, the, the alternative places that refugees were being housed. There were lots of, you couldn't throw a rock without hitting a researcher looking at um, camps or um, the, the sort of more traditional large-scale humanitarian places um, but uh, there were when I was there uh, more than 2,000 men women and children living in squats um, of varying degrees of, of kind of um, conditions um, I should I should also make clear at this point that I, I always I always work with people um, so I'm not studying the people I'm I, I'm looking at places and things with people. Um, it's very collaborative. Um, so yeah, in, in a way, in documenting these sort of sites of, um, of alternative or um, philanthropic voluntary activist sites, uh, I, I see what I do as a type of activist cultural heritage. So very briefly, just to, to um, talk you through some of the squats, um, from left to right, uh, starting at the top, the hospital squat was evicted the night after I arrived in Athens. Um, I happened to be staying on the same street. And it's just off Achenon, uh, which is one of the main streets um, coming out of uh, the sort of city centre. Um, I heard it, I heard the eviction uh, before my phone, I was on a, on a phone chain, um, but I heard the eviction happening um, and there were lights, um, lots of police, and 200 men, women, and children were made homeless at four o'clock in the morning. Um, the irony of this is that the building is owned by the International Cross, International Red Cross. Quora, um, which is not actually a squat, uh, is a cooperative, which sadly they've, they haven't stopped working, but they've had to leave the building they were in. Um, they offered all manner of legal, medical, educational, even fully licensed dental surgery to refugees. Um, there was no accommodation, but they were open from 8 till 10 every day. And lots of uh, families travelled in from places like Galeniko, which is a big camp on the edge of Athens, um, to spend their days there. Um, at the time I was there, Kora was providing 800 meals a day uh, for less than a third of the price of meals served at the camps. This is paid for by the, by the UNHCR and people like that. Um, and one, one Iranian man said to me, uh, before I came to Kora, I thought all Europeans just eat soup uh, and, and watery pasta. And um, then he came to Kora and they was you know, making wraps and traditional Greek salad. And he said, this is fantastic. So he, 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 volunteered, he volunteered there 
um, by way of kind of uh, contributing. Then the Soho Hotel, which is the bottom left, um, was run by NGO Solidarity Now. Um, the hotel was commissioned by the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, the UNHCR, and the NGO was paid 3,000 euros per day uh, to house and feed 200 people. And it's pretty hard to see where that money's going, <laughs> I have to confess. Um, Ammonia Square, I add, because it's a really important node in a kind of networked landscape of refugee, temporary refugee shelter. Um, people met there, and every day you'd see literally hundreds of predominantly men uh, with suitcases, mobile phones, trying to make contacts, trying to find the next step on their journey, whether that was somewhere to stay the night or, or, or to be trafficked. Um, and then City Plaza um, is a squat run by activists housing 400 people. It's a sort of golden ticket uh, place within the, within the community I was working with. Everyone wanted to be in City Plaza because it, uh, it was a really nice place. You know, it was an, a purpose-built hotel that was taken over, so families have um, a room and a bathroom. It's not salubrious, but they have their own space. But also, um, it, there's a real sense of, um, you know, we, we live together, we fight together, and that people were working together. Refugees and volunteers, there was no distinction. Everyone worked in the kitchens, cleaned, maintained the place, um, and organized big rallies and, and demonstrations and that type of thing. Um, and also for me, I th as a woman, there was some really interesting, very important cultural transformation work going on there because um, you had men who came from cultures where traditionally they'd never had to lift a finger in the house never cleaned the loo, never chopped a vegetable, and they had to. <laughs> and they had to learn these skills. And so that was a good introduction to Europe and just, you know, being the way that traditionally we, we have moved on from, from women doing all of the domestic chores, um, as I like to remind my husband. Uh, <laughs> so then the, there are these other places that aren't really located in, um, uh, like, like all types of homelessness, it's quite... As an archaeologist, there's all sorts of materiality, but the mapping and documenting, it's difficult to do what Tina was doing because the sites are transient and ephemeral. And um, particularly with homelessness and refugees, uh, this is even more the case because you get moved on for all sorts of political reasons. Um, but just quickly, the Human Kitchen was an incredible project uh, run by Costa, who is a Greek who believes that people should eat together. And so um, it started as uh, just people volunteering, um, donating small packets of pasta or some tomatoes or some eggs. And then it's grown to here this enormous pot. And as an archeologist, uh, I was very moved to learn that the spoon he's stirring the big pot with is actually an ore that was given to him by a man who landed on the beaches in Kos, um, who arrived with his life jacket and his body and this ore, and he just said, thank you for feeding me. This is all I have in return. And so Costa now uses the ore to, to stir the pot. Um, there's also regular public, or, or there's, there's street shelters which are not just uh, refugees. There's, as I mentioned earlier, lots of very poor people in Greece who live on the streets in, in different camps and um, sort of, Little, little doorways and spaces like, like this. Um, some of the refugees I spoke with preferred to live like this than, than enter the squats, some of which had very extreme anarchist ideology. Um, and then, then there's a sort of regular sense of solidarity among demonstrations. One of the things I was very impressed by with Athens is that every day there's a demonstration um, and people um, are able to um, people do, whether or not their voice is heard is debatable, but, but um, in terms of refugees and, and the sense that, uh, like coming from, from Britain, in Athens I was there for mm, about a month and there were more visible, loud, noisy public demonstrations about we, you know, we, we really do believe that, that we have to take more people into Europe than there were in Britain, which, which just, I, I think if I were coming from another country, I would, I would just... There's more visible support for people um, in Athens. Um, and then there are these kind of momentary, transitory, very ephemeral, 
interventions in the, in the structure of the city that Athena mentioned earlier, which I find really interesting because as you're walking through the city, um, there's stuff written everywhere, stuff stuck everywhere, posters everywhere, um, with messages um, often of, sort of love, support, hope. And this is also why I ended up leaving the city interpreting it as a landscape of, of um, reluctant support. So why, why reluctant? Um, well, um, even before the so-called so refugee crisis, which actually um, Christopoulos describes as a reception crisis, which I'd agree with, Athens was suffering from a fairly extreme level of unemployment and poverty. Um, drugs are a really big problem. There remain widespread um, unemployment problems, shortages of food and housing among the poorest people. So I don't suggest that, um, that naturally Athenians are more humanitarian than other Europeans. Although it is true that there, there exists a very long-standing cultural legacy um, of the stranger being made welcome in Greece. So if you think of pilgrims, merchants, wealthy 19th century tour, uh, sort of northern Europeans on the Grand Tour, um, sunshine-seeking tourists, and then within the past 30 years, more likely to have been immigrants from Albania or first wave Afghans. And then more recently still, Syrian refugees have been the recipients of phylloxenia. Um, but the sort of Greek cultural practice of being hospitable to strangers is also um, a way of sustaining boundaries. Um, so as Katerina Rizaku puts it, philoxenia is a practice of sovereignty and control over the stranger. It's a one-way offer and also the means of dealing with alterity. It's an act of interest and at the same time one of power. Of course, also the geography of Greece is one of the reasons why so many migrants and refugees um, attempt to go to Greece to get to Northern and Western Europe. And once the EU-Turkey deal was struck, the borders really hardened. Um, as I said earlier, there are 60,000 people estimated, probably a lot more, um, stuck now in Greece with very lit little prospect of moving forward um, with their intended journey, but also some try to move back and that's equally difficult. Um, so when I describe Athens as a, a landscape of reluctant refuge, it's because um, people are hesitant about providing shelter and ambivalent about the options. There are also um, some really clear problems with some of the squats. There are people smugglers, traffickers, drugs, prostitution. In some of them, children are not safe. In some of them, women are certainly not safe. Um, but there are also some really shiny examples of, of kind of alternative humanitarianism, particularly a city plaza, um, Fora, although not a squad to cooperative, and to some extent, not at our 26. And when I, I do accept that some of these sort of better places have very complicated ideological positions, um, particularly, you know, polit political allegiances, whether that's extreme anarchism or with Syriza, who are no longer a marginal party, but in power. Um, to my mind, in terms of the material structure of these places as models of alternative refugee accommodation, I think there's an awful lot to be learned. The spaces and services that some of these smaller, unofficial places of shelter offer to refugees represent far more humane opportunities to retain cultural, familial, and personal identity. And they also um, enable cultural transformation and, tra and um, transmission to take place in a more, uh, sort of on a more human scale and a more peaceable and sustainable way. So I think that the squats and co-ops of Athens have an awful lot to teach um, the international global humanitarian sector. Um, which I can critique till the cows come home. Um, and having been awarded a British Academy Fellowship, that's what I'm going to do in the next three years. Thank you. Thank you.